Hello, everyone, and welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is my esteemed colleague, Anthony. Anthony. Good evening, everyone. Good to be back. And so, uh, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com, that's coordinates to get a hold of me and tell me your story. Uh, I don't discriminate. People say, well, the story's really crazy. It's going to knock your socks off. Knock my socks off. I want to hear it. I want to know. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Of what we've heard and, and different stories that we've accumulated over the years. Here, here's the thing. We have a Patreon. Yeah, and- the Patreon is patreon.com slash PRT podcast. And the link to that, as well as anything relevant to the show, is going to be in the description box of the YouTube video. So just go down there. You can find the links to everything you need to interact with the show, to support it, join the Patreon, whatever you need. Yeah, there's, there's. If you, if you get a ten dollar tier after three months, you get a swag bag. Twenty dollars get you a swag bag instantly. Thirty get you a super swag bag. So go and join the Patreon. It's a great way to support the show. Um, there's also a five dollar uh, member. Yeah, it's, it's a five dollar a month YouTube membership. If you look down at the subscribe button now, there's going to be a second button right next to it that says join. You click on that, you sign up for it, it's five bucks a month. You get a neat little badge next to your name if you participate in the live chats or, or leave a comment on our videos. And it's just a way to make your name stand out. and Great way to get recognized. Yeah. And, th- and, and support the show at the same time. Folks, we have a conference coming up. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. We want you to go. There's a bunch of speakers, a bunch of names. I'm sure you've heard us talk about it. Um, a bunch of, I just can't even get into all the people that are going to be there. It's going to be the Dogman Cryptid Conference. If you go to Eventbrite, the Eventbrite page, it's Paranormal Roundtable presents the Dogman Cryptid Conference, the second annual Dogman Cryptid Conference. Go join. I mean, go uh, buy your tickets and meet us in Fort Worth uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, also that being said, if every show we drop, we, 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 we put it on to the Facebook, uh, group. Um, so if you go to paranormal Roundtable Facebook group and you leave a comment, you could win a book, an autographed uh, book from one of many authors that we are, that are associated with the show, like Ken Gerhard, uh, Lyle Blackburn, David Weatherly, Nick Redfern, uh, DA Roberts, it could be anybody, Ron Murphy, Chad Lewis, Barton Nunley. So go and and do that. Also, uh, be, just join the group. There's a ton of stories and content and information in that group too. And also, if you send me a friend request on Facebook, make sure that you let me know that, hey, I'm a listener of the show, so I'll approve you. Otherwise, I may not. And then don't forget, I'm Josh Turner 940 on Instagram. Go follow me on Instagram and uh, I may follow you back. So everybody, uh, that's all the information we got. Is that it? We're done. We're ready to rock and roll. Yep. Let's get into let's it. Let's get to the show. Do you do you also do you think whenever we come across like okay like Linda Godfrey she was the one who first wrote about the dog man the beast of Bray Road she got the file from a police re- from some police reports in the town of Elkhorn Wisconsin so she's cr- often credited with you know kind of being the groundbreaking uh you know journalist whatever but in truth, I mean, the, 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 the dog man was talked about in Michigan and in folklore long before Linda Godfrey, uh, had actually wrote about it. She's just the one that kind of brought it to the forefront. And then of course, a lot of people came forward with stories and said, Hey, I saw this, I saw that. Then you had guys doing podcasts and making shows. And one of them uh, in particular, I ended up being a part of for six years, but you, I got so many different stories, and some of them I did go over with that individual who, who uh, you know, gave me my introduction to uh, being on shows and stuff and talking about it. But I, I had corresponded with Linda years, years ago. It was the first time I ever corresponded with her. And we had gone over cases together, like, you know, off, off air or whatever. And I finally had gotten her to come on my show. And um, I had just – it was more like emails back and forth, things like that. And a lot of people credit her with being the one that kind of started it, but it was already going on. It's just that she tapped into that vein, like, hey, there's something going on here. And somebody needs to write about it because nobody's writing about it. And then there was this explosion about that phenomenon. And people were like, well, there's somebody already writing all these books about it. You know, they feel a little more or a little less trepidation in talking about it. They're willing to come out and talk about this. Look, I saw this thing. It looked like a freaking werewolf. Now, Hollywood has done a lot to damage that because they're like, well, 
this is a werewolf and it's changing from a man into a beast. And so what you had, you saw had to have been a, a, some sort of a beast that, you know, the moonlight came out and whatever. And so people think, oh, that's absolutely ridiculous. And so now there's this stigma attached to anybody who says that this thing could be a werewolf. But it's like you said, was it done on purpose? Did Linda Godfrey actually touch on a, a something and strike a nerve and then toward the end of her life, you know, and I know because I spoke to her, I don't care what anybody says. And I had witnesses that were with me when I talked to her, like Barton Nunley. Um, and, you know, he's another author and a friend. And we talked to Linda, you know, corresponded with her over the years, like different times. And I know that she had kind of gone full circle. She thought, well, this is just a creature that's out there that's like that all the time. Till to uh, almost like saying, hey, maybe there is that creature that's like that all the time, but there's also this werewolf that's maybe a shapeshifter or interdimensional. We don't know what this is. We're getting reports of these things like changing and doing. And she was she was so kind of apprehensive. She was apprehensive and kind of beat down by societal norms that are put on us, these parameters that say that, hey, you didn't see an alien in, a, in an elevator, like one of my uh, listeners, you know, came on my show and said he did um, at a very large computer company. That's not true. You got that from Land of the Lost. You and Chaka are over there seeing reptiles, you know. Um, that's not real, you know, because because it was on Land of the Lost, you know, or because this was on The Howling or this was on some other, you know, show American Werewolf in London or Werewolf in whatever country. Um, that has to be what happened with Linda Godfrey. That has to be, you know, she just got wrapped up in the whole Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. So that's their crutch that they can fall back on and say, look, see, these people are seeing werewolves. They got to be cuckoo bananas. They'll be out of their minds. You're seeing vampires. Oh, okay. You're a fan of the Lost Boys. So that makes it, you know, what are you, Van Helsing, you know? And, and that's the way for them to shrug it off because it's fiction, because you made something that was fiction. And I believe that there is a group of people, a cabal, if you will, that actually do control what comes out and what is, what is shown to the masses. But I, I do believe that they are starting to slip some and, and, you know, you can see very clearly, very clearly an agenda within all of the, of the modern media. Whenever you look at it and you go, Oh, is this an independent film? Is this an older film? You know, maybe 10 years ago, or is this something coming out recent you see it right there. You go, oh, there's the agenda right there. And I can spot it a mile away. And I'm like, okay, so this is not, this is, you know, some bull crap. But they package it in a way to where it is in your psyche and it's embedded that it is fiction. So that if you see this, you think it's fiction. And I had a guy on my show that, that gave me a story that I told on my show about a reptilian thing biting a guy's head in an Atlantic City elevator. And everybody's like, oh, that couldn't have happened because, you know, we had to, whatever, you'd have to be able to find something out about it. There's nothing going to be written about it, of course. But he he got away with it by saying, what was that? Some kind of hidden camera prank? And he just walked off. And then the, the people that were there, they just let him go because they thought he's not even believing what he just saw. Because you've been so conditioned that if something comes up out of the sewer that looks like a werewolf and these two children, you know, actually saw this. And it's a story that Linda Godfrey told, and I told one very similar. Um, but these children were playing, and they see this werewolf-looking thing come up out of the un, under from under the ground. Which, like I said, I've heard this story before. It's in, it's told different ways, but because it's different people seeing this, but then they're all just categorized as people mistaking something from fiction into this reality. So that's a good way for them to cover this because if you talk about Montauk or Dulce and you say, look, there's all kinds of experiments going on. There's all kinds of creatures coming out of these underground tunnels and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? You just, you just been watching movies, dude. You watch the Stranger Things or uh sure. Better movie, Beyond the Black Rainbow. I don't, I don't know if you've seen oh, that movie, Chris. Of course. Oh, he's one of my gosh. favorite. Uh, Panos Cosmatos, one of my favorite oh, filmmakers. Oh, yeah. He, he's, he's, he's such a, a unique. Uh, I love the cinematography of his movies. Oh, he's great. Even if his yeah. movies are over the top. <laughs> no, I have the Mandy axe in my office. Oh, dude. It's, Mandy was a trip. That, that, yeah, that, that, that movie's wild. Yeah, yeah Mandy no, was great. That was, that was weird. <laughs> I'll watch anything he, he makes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. Stranger Things ripped off their whole aesthetic from Panos Cosmatos. 
From Beyond the Black Rainbow. Possibly. Have you seen Montauk Chronicles? <laughs> <laughs> I was well, just about to say no, Montauk I mean, like Chronicles. in the way they presented the aesthetics of their show, like the cinematography, the color palettes, it's all t taken from Beyond the Black yeah, Rainbow. Did you see my doc? Yeah. Did, and you watched all the recreations and everything you didn't see? Because there's a guy, remember, you know the uh, website Thrillist? He did a side-by-side -side comparison to scenes in Montauk Chronicles wow. to... Uh, some of Stranger Things ads and different, I mean, like identically ripped off. Jeez. My stuff came out years before Stranger Things was even made. Right. So, it, you know, first version came out in 2012. I never so, went beyond the first season of Stranger Things. Yeah. But again, they, they did their, you know, look, I mean, I had a, I had a show deal before Stranger Things was even released and it had nothing to do with that. But then the network said, well, since, you know, your doc partially inspired that, or at least the story you covered, right? Because they have to be careful about what they say. Um, you know, we're going to use that in some of the advertising. I said, well, do what you will, but I think my shows have their own legs. Why don't we just, you know, why don't we just do it the way it is? And, um, but yeah, I mean, the Stranger Things ripped off 40 different movies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's sure a success, did. and and if and if what I can say about it is this: like that's a good thing. Number one, it puts the ideas out there. Um, it brought extra attention to anything Montauk related that I did. Uh, so it's a positive thing, and I don't think it's a bad show. But yeah, I mean, in a better world, and this is why I think you guys are really going to love Jodorowsky's Dune, the documentary, is that in this alternate reality where Panos Cosmonos is a truly a celebrated filmmaker, you know, and as he should be. Um, and Jodorowsky's Dune was created. That's a much cooler reality, but we can make that right. The whole idea is like, let's not lament what didn't happen or happened in some other alternate dimension. But now we have the opportunity being that we have freedom uh, is to make these things our own versions of them, you know, Panos Kazmanos is making another movie. Um, I'm, I have so many, I must, my, my ideas going forward are untouchable. Like I cannot wait to execute these things into film. And, um, especially the movie I'm writing right now, it's just as trippy as anything uh, Panos made, you know, and I can't wait to execute it. And I know I can. And so, you know, in other words, these people are going to do what they do. Let's, now make the things we need to make. And that's how you change. You can change the world. People say, oh, you can't change the world. It's like so many people have in the past. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you know, we have, not to get political, but there are world leaders who would rather interview, uh, I don't know how vulgar I can get on this show and I won't, but they'd rather interview, you know, Cardi B about her most world's popular song and the content thereof. The president of the United States interviewed her as opposed to somebody who would enlighten your mind a little bit better. No offense to her. She should be able to make what she wants to make, but should that have been the most popular song on earth? I don't think so. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and people always tell me, and they've been telling me this since I started this, that I'm doing it wrong. I get, I used to get tons of hate mail saying, why are you talking about werewolves? <laughs> because when you talk about werewolves, it dumbs down the dog man. I said, dog man. First of all, excuse me, excuse me. I didn't see a dog man. I didn't see a man mixed with dog. I didn't see a dog mixed with a man. No, I saw what looked like a freaking werewolf. Now, there's a precedent for that in a lot of fiction and in a lot of what people say is nonfiction, right? Okay, that's what I saw. I'm sorry, but it looked more like something out of the howling than some, you know, circus dog man freak thing that that, that term dog man conjures up. And there's some people out there that were telling me that there were these bullcrap podcasters at the time that have already fallen by the wayside. And I couldn't even stand the way they said dog man, dog man. I, just, I can't even stand the way they said it. <laughs> and I'm just like, dude, it's it just dog man, you know? Yeah, well, they're, they're not working on a, a level of thinking that's even worth talking about. I mean, look, if you could, you could go through so many different characters in fiction, let's say fictitious monsters, let's say traditional, you know, uh, Mary Shelley or universal monsters, each of those things have some credibility in reality. Frankenstein's monster can be made right now, you know, so you could say she was predicting the future, Mary Shelley. Um, H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau is 100% possible. Um, 
you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon. I mean, like maybe somewhere that thing exists. Oh, dude, we we just did that. We just did yeah. deep sea humanoids. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So it's yeah. like, how could you doubt these things when there's cre- credibility to back it up? And then that makes you re-examine the the folklore that came before it. Someone thought of these creatures for a reason. They had heard stories. They heard things. You know, they they looked back in history. People had ideas. What was Mary Shelley thinking? At that time, that a scientist named Frankenstein would revive or resurrect human tissue and make, you know, essentially a, a powerful version of of man, an abomination, and these ideas were there even before it. And so, I, I can't, I don't have any truck for a powerful somebody. Zombie. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a truck for anybody who just wants to shut down an idea or laugh at it because there was a cultural portrayal or a cinematic portrayal of it. And that's why ultimately, um, I, I said that about Stranger Things, like, yeah, you know, they, they ripped off, they ripped off ET, they ripped off a million movies. Um, and I guarantee you, they saw Panos Cosmatos' film. They saw Montauk Chronicles beforehand. Of course they did. They saw all this stuff. But at the end of the day, does it help or hurt? The stories, and I think it helps because, you know, that show is what you know one of the most popular shows in the world, and the fans are listening when the actors are out there having interviews saying this is based on allegedly true events, um, government programming, MK Ultra, all those things have been said in interviews. So it brought it to the forefront of culture. So it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. And uh, you know, it could have been a really poorly made piece of garbage and i don't think it is i think it's a you know a fun pop culture show it's definitely better than uh, another season of the kardashians <laughs> <laughs> or, or what is it i think i'd rather watch grass grow or another particular uh, guy i'm not gonna miss a name my head into a wall a guy that <laughs> goes around taking his shirt off and screaming it invisible oh, yeah. like, i don't want to get ghost I'm not, I'm not gonna say his name <laughs> i'm not gonna get into his show or whatever but and then or finding nothing another Good knuckle another, sandwich demon <laughs> Come on, bro. Come at me, bro. <laughs> Have you seen these abs? I haven't had a car up since 2012. You know, it's yeah, like. Yeah, <laughs> I had a moron say to me the other day, well, anyone that has a problem with him is afraid to be successful. And I just laughed. I'm like, buddy, you don't know anything. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, those. Uh, and then the finding nothing, though, that's just. I mean, that show goes on and on. And it's like, what, <laughs> what have you leaving, found? Like, jelly donuts, donuts on logs uh, and stuff. Beef for your oh, and, donuts. And then telling my and then telling some of my witnesses. Dude, what is wrong with you? Up in Washington. Folks, folks in the audience were just letting off steam at the moment, but <laughs> you but, know. So truth. I'll tell you what Bigfoot loves. Big giant dunces in the middle of the woods. So <laughs> with donuts. You're the bait, not yeah, the donut. With the donut. You yeah. are the donut. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it's obvious. You know, if there is something out there, and I believe there is, they're they're seeing and hearing and smelling these morons you know, thousands of yards away. And it's like, okay, keep banging your pots and pans or whatever. But <laughs> honestly, and and it, and that's great because let them keep doing what they're doing. It just creates a better platform for us to deliver something to the audience that w- we truly want for ourselves and for you and, and change this thing and also examine these things. Because, yeah, it has to be entertaining, but is your idea entertainment stupid because i worked within these networks and their mantra is the audience is stupid christopher that's what they said to me over and over again i said no they're not they're not stupid yep and that's why they create if if you notice in every episode of these network shows is that they'll create false cliffhangers every before every commercial break but they'll never deliver ever i mean 28 seasons of never delivering i would have tuned it out you know yeah, well, like you tune it after the first first few episodes. Yeah, right. I was like, dude, this is crap, crap, you know. But and then they'll use the excuse, well, that's what people want. If you've no, been, it's not. yeah, if you've only eaten triscuits and water for your entire existence, and you're say you're a 25 year old human, um, uh, somebody gives you a Ritz, you're like, whoa, what is this? You know. Well, you only wanted Triscuits because that's what you knew of as nourishment. So they kept giving it to you. And they're like, that's what he wants is Triscuits and water. Has he ever been given a, a, a different type of cracker? No, he hasn't. He's just been eating that. So he right. thinks that he's, in his mind, that's what's good. 
they, you know, I, I've raised lots of animals, lots of pets, you know, and when you give a dog a certain, you know, type of food, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, veterinarians will tell you too, don't change their diet, you know. Um, and, and if you give them a more expensive pet food that tastes better, they're probably going to want that. And they're not going to want that other crap anymore because, you know, even as a kid, you learn like, this is, this tastes better. I want this. I don't want that. You know, I mean, you move on from baby food to eating like, you know, grown up food because baby food's not going to cut it anymore. You don't want that. But if all you've ever given, been given your whole life is applesauce, well, then you're going to, you're going to equate that with good nourishment because you don't yeah. know any better. And things are only... They are only the way they are until they're not. I used I, I learned that years ago when I was working downtown in Austin, and there was this huge way that things were done. There was this huge uh, push to, from for everybody to kind of conform. And well, this is just the way it's always been done. And I went in a different direction and said, "No, no, uh, you people want that because that's all you're offering them. They, they, you know, if they go to a club and it's exhilarating and it's exciting and it's new." It's because you made it that way. So you had to have people who were innovative and not just ripping off names from, you know, clubs up in, in Las Vegas and in LA, you know, and just throwing a coat of paint on it and saying, we're just going to do this because this is quote unquote, the way to do things. And I've always, you know, considered myself, everybody wants to consider themselves that, but I've always considered myself thinking outside the box, not even living anywhere near the box and being more of a maverick and just saying, why, you know, kind of being a gambler and just throwing it to the wind, just see what happens. I do that on my show every week. I just, you know, let's just throw it out there and see what happens. Why, why sit around and waste your time with the criticism and people mistake that when I, uh, get combative with certain people and their negative comments, they think, Oh, you're getting emotionally invested. And in, I don't give a crap. What these people say, I, I'm just a troll. <laughs> Just, I just <laughs> like to I like to engage because that's what I used to do at my club. I used to sit there and people would, yeah, club sucks. Oh, well, you stink, you know. And I'd I'd go back and forth with people, you know. And and it's like you know they they'd come back the next week. I thought my club sucked. I thought you didn't like it. Or I thought it was terrible. It was like uh, I was just drunk. And, and oh, okay, well, have a good night. You know, let me get you a drink. You know, and I made friends like that. And yeah. people would talk trash and we talk trash back and then they'd come back the next week sober and f not even know that they had said some stupid things. But that that's just how it was. Yeah, in this case, we just come in with, um, and again, all this stuff is in, in different stages of production for sure. And, you know, we're not just talking smack. It's you, you come with, with something that burns so bright that it changes these things and these these stories are fantastic and they should be portrayed in a different way i believe that so that's why i'm making them in a different way you believe that and that's why you're portraying and making these things in a different way and yeah it's time the other stuff goes away it's it doesn't need to be here they can say every you know, it has, everything has a place it's like yeah not when it's this repetitive i think it had <laughs> its day shelf. 20 years is enough time for um, an era. It's time for it to end. And the way to end it is to just create something better. And, and we are. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a fatalist. I'm not a Nietzschean or whatever, but one of the things that I, I, I did like about Nietzsche is when he says that which is falling should be pushed. And I understood that completely, even as a young man. And what it is, is when something begins to rot and smell, it's time to get rid of it. It's time to clean it out. It's time to throw it away. It's had its time. It's had its day. It's now a relic. Everything has an expiration date. And one thing I know about the great filmmakers, whether they're filmmakers or actors or radio personalities or they're builders of whatever they build or whatever they do in whatever you know arena they're in, or if they're a great fighter or a musician, you have to change with the times or you set the tone. You set the tone and make the times. Because if you're not doing those things, then you're going to go away because nobody's going to go, oh yeah, you know what? The Bee Gees, let's bring that back and let's wear bell-bottom pants and let's do this, let's do that. It's already been done. <laughs> it's already been done and you can only do it to death so many times and you're like, that era is over and done with. Disco is what it is. You know, it had its time. You know, the Romans had their time and, you know, we're having our time and, and you have, but you have to change if you don't change then that becomes the end. If you look at great organizations, take sports, for example, you, you're looking at dynasties who were good for two decades, like the New England Patriots, you know, 
And one of my favorite teams, the Houston Astros. Like, oh, they were cheaters, blah, blah, blah. Well, so were the Yankees, so were the Red Sox, so were the Dodgers. The Astros just got in trouble for it. Well, the Red Sox did too, but the Yankees and Dodgers got away with it. But the bottom line is they won in 2017. They really started in 2015, and then they and they won just, just up until 2022. And now they're they're kicking butt again this year, and they're down like three or four of their best hitters and three or four of their best pitchers. That is a system. That is changing with the times, and that is ever-changing. And, and they have a system in place that is m propelling them to greatness. What you have to do is build that system. Whether you are the head of that system or a part of that system, it takes all the cogs to make that system be a reality. And then it perpetuates itself, and it just kind of builds on itself, and it becomes a winning culture. That's what you do. That's, that is the key. People don't understand that. And they think, well, this is the way it's always been done. So I got to copy this. And that's how you make a taco. And I, you know what? That's how you make your taco. But I'm going to, you know, create it with something else and do something else, make it completely healthy and make it palatable. And people think that that person's crazy. They thought that, you know, Colonel Sanders was crazy, but he was <laughs> successful. And when he was what, 60? How old was he, Anthony? I believe Colonel Sanders was 65 by the time he actually started KFC. But before that, he had, he had just multiple failed business ventures, just one after the other. Seemed like the, the guy couldn't catch a break until he did. And then the guy that owned Win owns Wendy's, Dave, whatever, he was one of his pupils, one of his uh, disciples. He literally uh, was the manager of KFCs. But, and then he broke out on his own and he, he used that recipe for success. And he, you know, because just like with me writing the books and you know it's like i went to people who'd done it before now i'm not going to do exactly what they did because i want to do something different but you have to find people who've done it and been successful take their advice but when it's time you have to break out on your own you have to change and you have to break the mold that's the only way to stand out and then continually be successful is finding your rhythm, finding that formula, finding people around you and surrounding yourself with successful positive people, you know, like you I'm Chris. Sure, yeah. yeah. And Likewise. and you get together and we have rap sessions you and I and we come up with some uh, amazing ideas and it's been like a uh, very uh awake, I don't want to say awakening, but like it it's made me more aware. You know, I'm a more aware wolf now than I was. <laughs> it's a corny <laughs> joke. But you see what I'm saying? Like like talking to yeah, you, yeah. we we started to to, to kind of click and you we bounced ideas back and forth off of each other. And I thought, man, this is the way to go, you know. And and, and people will sit there and tell you, that'll never work. You can't do that. They did that with my last conference. They poo-pooed it to death, and it was a success. And they're doing it again this year. If it's a success, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. You know, the bottom line is it'll bring a lot of amazing people together. That is the, the main goal for it. And if people want to be spectators of that, then great. If they don't want to be, fine. Oh, but, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, you can't, there's no way, it's impossible. And I did it, you know. Mm -hmm. You did when it. When I was done with Montauk Chronicles, you know, I was working for an alarm company. I was uh, shooting football games on the weekends. I was making local commercials to finance it. And it wasn't a lot of money and I single-handedly made it. And when I was done, I remember there were some people that were like, well, what are you going to do now? And it's like, listen, I'm going to sell the DVDs and Blu-rays. And then I'm going to parlay this into a television series. They laughed. And guess what I did within a year? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. I, I never listened to those voices. I, it, it gets stale hearing people because they, they swing back and forth like when you have a TV show or whatever, they shut up and when there's nothing, or at least in their perspective, nothing's happening, but you're working on stuff, they're like, oh, what's going on now? And then something comes out and I learned to just be like, okay, well, nice to hear from you again. Take it easy. You know, I'm working on the next thing. It will come out. It will be a success. And that's me and that's my pattern. But there also comes a time, like you're saying, now it's time to let's let's crank it up as high as we ever have. Let's push it further than ever. And I'm ready to do that now. And I had to, I almost lost my footing. I could have been doing, I could have been a network boy for, you know, 10 years. And it was like, no, no, that's not the way. I don't care what they're paying me. That is not the way. I came here to do something. I came here to accomplish something. I know you did. And so it's time. You're not going to do that. It, look, Success to them is, hey, this guy's got tons. I don't care how much money that jackass is making. It means nothing to me. What about the people that are ingesting this repetitive stuff over and over again? That means nothing. 
it means nothing to the look at Rod Serling. We're talking about him right this second. His show, The Twilight Zone, is immortal for a reason. All right. And the some of these things that we've haven't even named, but everyone knows what we're talking about, are not immortal. They are disposable and for a reason. So when when your mind is fed something fresh and new and it's available to everyone, which now we can do, we can hit 25 different streaming networks now that are just as accessible as what was monopolized. That's why you were fed these shows over the last 20 years, because they were monopolized still. They're no longer monopolized. Movie making and making television shows are not monopolized anymore. And the knowledge is out there and you can learn now for free. Uh, you know, I had to go to film school and I had to practice for 20 years, but people can learn now. Now it's just about your spirit, your imagination, your intellect, and and your passion and apply that. That's not going to be easy, but what a wonderful challenge. That's how I feel. And you look at somebody like Rod Sterling. He died in 1975. I don't remember. I know. I don't remember what month. I know it was around my birthday because I was born in, in, in July. Yeah, I was born in July 76. So he died the year before I was born. I think he was, he died in July 75. Yeah, he died. He died sometime like that. I know he, I, he had like a heart attack, but he was only like 50 or something. I think he was like 50 years old. Yeah. And when you look at his life and what he did, he left behind a legacy that people, you know, you, you'll all like, we're talking about him right now. He died before we were born, like literally. And we're talking about him right now. He's immortalized. And, and people can look back and go, he had a great product because some of these people who are producing these shows and, and doing some of this stuff and making some of this stuff and not to just bag on them, but when you go back and you 20 years from now, you can still watch Twilight Zone today and it looks, it's the same. I just saw the episode the other day with the, the guy that was on the, the, the uh, planet and he had gotten sentenced to go to a planet and be alone. And they took pity on him and they gave him like a female companion that turned to be a robot. I just watched that one the other day. It's fantastic. You know, and it's like timeless. It is. Dude, th these other shows, they're not going to age well. They are not going to age well. You cannot go back and watch those shows and go, wow, dude, this is so great to go back and watch this. It's like, and if you even do uh, try to, uh, you know, take, take like, you know, for example, you go back and you, you feel nostalgic and you go and you play the 8-bit graphic Nintendo. I tried playing Castlevania the other day and I was like, yeah, okay, this is not, I can't. <laughs> but Castlevania is 10 times more elaborate well, than the yeah. show. Hey, he, do you remember that time with the 500th time that that jackass turned on the fake green night vision thing again and yelled at nothing? <laughs> Wasn't that great? Remember that episode? Do you remember the name of that episode? Yeah. I don't. That was season one through 19. Let's watch it again. You know, and it's so I, I got accurate. through Castlevania and I, I beat the giant bat. And I said, okay, this is fun for nostalgic purposes, and now I don't really want to play this anymore. Playing Castlevania is like a Stanley Kubrick movie in comparison <laughs> to, the, to those shows. You know, and it, and it is. And it's still, even that didn't captivate me for more than, you know, 15 minutes. And it's like, okay, yeah, it's great. It had its time. Blades is still great. Cool. Had its time. <laughs> but it's over, you know. I, it's it, and, and still, they're immortalized games. Street Fighter, the original I could still play that. That one's timeless. But there are some that you just, you go back and, and there is no nostalgia with these other shows and there's not going to be. There's not no, going to be. There no. never was. And it's like, you know, what are we waiting for? For the next season of letdowns where nothing happens, they don't find anything, they don't prove anything, they don't even really drop any sort of like actual, like we talk on this show and on your show, you do the same thing. You, you, you don't find the answers, but at least you postulate on some theory or, hey, what do you think could be going on with this? You know, sure. they don't even ask those questions. It's like, there's not even any kind of, there's no substance to it. It's like brain dead TV. It's reality TV that just needs to go away. It's nonsense. And when you start going down the rabbit hole and you start finding answers and you start looking at the whole enchilada you start to realize how stupid and compartmentalized and ridiculous the whole thing is. There needs to be a paradigm shift and it needs to happen now. It is. Yeah. yeah. It's going to, I believe it's going to begin in this forthcoming year. I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm the only one. I know there are other people that are fully capable and I hope we all do it because there's room for everybody. Obviously, the people that love these stories and, and, and these perspectives are, they have a voracious appetite and they want as much as they can get. So, 
there's really the competition is let's try and outdo ourselves, you know, let's, let's keep pushing ourselves and let's support the other people that are doing something interesting because the audience is there for all of us. The one pe the one group they will leave is the stuff that is repetitive on these networks that is just done to death. The downfall of this and they'll never do it right is that once our stuff going forward does achieve what we want it to achieve, then the networks are going to try and survive and imitate us. And you saw what happened in, let's say, all right, let's say this is analogous to music. Whereas like, you know, I, I hate calling it this, but the alternative of the grunge era came in, Kurt Cobain comes in. And then you had, after Cobain killed himself, you had all those horrible corporate versions of Nirvana that I couldn't, I wouldn't listen to if you paid me. That's what's going to happen. But hey, let's be the innovators and change things for a while. And um, I, you know, I can't wait. I mean, I'm doing it right now. And let's see if I can put my uh, my movies and my shows where my mouth is. I believe I can. Yeah. Well, I heard some of your material you told me the other day, and it's all in. It's with me. I'm not going to let it divulge it to anyone or tell anyone because you asked me not to. Um, but suffice it to say, folks, that I listened to what you were saying, and it was it was pretty good. I was I was stoked, and and having first seen you on TV, and I was sitting there watching, and I and I was like, I sat there in bed, and I told my wife, I said, that guy is freaking smart. <laughs> I was like, that guy, he's captivating my attention. You know how hard it is to make me give a crap about someone's opinions or that you know on TV. It's almost impossible. Anthony, you know this. Yeah, I'm a stupid, dumb millennial. But Montauk Chronicles is two hours long, and it managed to, to uh, keep my millennial monkey brain entertained for that long. You're not so a stupid. There you go. You're one of the standouts. <laughs> no, you, honestly, I didn't say I, – I've been thinking – you guys are brilliant. You know, uh, every I've listened to you, and, um, you know, it, it definitely gives the, the world hope. And I'm sure you haven't eaten any Tide Pods, but that's what the news <laughs> wants everyone – that, that's what the news wants everyone to think. An entire generation behaves that way. You don't eat the Tide Pods. You smoke them. Duh. Oh. <laughs> Everybody knows that. God, you're old. Pe people people got, got sick and uh, and they unlived by doing Tide Pods. So I'm now we smoke them. Over a thousand years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, point being, I, I was genuinely impressed with the, the narrative and visual talent put into uh, Montauk oh, yeah. Chronicles that was able to hook you in and reel you in and just keep reeling. It, does, it just doesn't stop. And I'm so looking forward to checking out Strange World. Yeah, Strange World oh, was, thanks, you man. know, and the fact that the weird thing, and I've already said this on my show, I'm not going to keep repeating it to my audience, but I've said this before recently, you know, that it's so weird that I've had, you know, I had an experience out there, same place where you did the investigation by the lake. And then, you you know, I, I took a story from some individuals who saw this werewolf looking creature. It's an area of high strangeness. And and you went straight to the house where I had been saying, even before I went to that house party and somebody told me, Yeah, that house down the road's haunted, you know, I knew it was haunted. I had and then you confirmed it on that show. To me, when it got to that episode, because I'd already watched a few others before that, and I don't watch many. It was like fate. I said, Okay, this guy. I can work with this dude. This is somebody who's not an idiot, who's got vision, he's smart, and, and you're charismatic, but you're understanding of what you're doing. You have a grasp on it, a handle. You know, so many people, they, they get the nod to go out and do something, and it's it's either fake it till you make it bullcrap. You know what I mean? No, I don't. Yeah, I couldn't possibly be that way. Yeah. A strange World was 75% of my vision executed what's 100% of that original style that I proposed to the network and got greenlit. Cause you know, by the end of the day, we had eight editors on strange world. I had to fight with a lot of people for what I wanted. And I don't, for a haunting, we will go, which is the first chapter of my new series feature length. It's purely me. It's my fault if it sucks. And I'm fine with that, but nobody else has their hands in it. And you're someone I'd love to collaborate with. Um, on this other thing we're talking about. But now, you know, the goal was always, and any filmmaker worth their salt will tell you, I need final cut. What that means is I need control over the canvas. I need it. It's not a totalitarian way of thinking. It is, it is a vision that the only way you're going to get it out is either you have close confidants that you work together with. You can't wrestle with a network. This is the old story. And that's what's, um, Rod Serling was going through was that he was bummed, especially when he got to Night Gallery, that oh, yeah. 
they thought they saw him as a, a novelty, an outdated novelty, and and didn't regard his brilliance. And he was smarter than all of them put together. And they were just like, oh, it's just great that you're here. And it's like they put these idiots in charge, and those people, they have they have a ticking clock. It's a sinking ship. It's going down. And because it's no longer monopolized. And if everyone who desires to create and has the ability, we could all get together on this, um, realizes that you sink that ship. And now, like Jodorowsky, going back to him, and you've got to watch that documentary Jodorowsky's doing, you'll, you'll enjoy what I'm about to say even more, that his ideas and that dimension, that wonderful dimension with Panos Cosmonos is a celebrated filmmaker, and all these films are changing people's consciousness, will exist. And that is worth making happen. And so I figured I'm going to do that for the rest of my time here and really push for that because I already was part of the system for a minute. And I, I'm like, okay, well, this is okay. See ya. You know, let, let's get back to work. So that's how I feel now. Then let me ask you a question, Chris. You, you and I have talked at length about all kinds of different subjects. And you, we talked about ghosts. We talked about life after death. We talked about all these different types of things. But you told me something that surprised you said you've actually seen an, a ghost. I, I have, but I mean, you claim that you have. I have. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know what that was, but I guess I heard one first when I was 14 for two nights in a row. And I've told this story before. Um, so what happened was I was staying at a buddy's house. I was 14 years old. Normal night, we were hanging out, listening to music, you know, and uh, watched a couple of movies. And I was chilling out on his floor. I fell asleep. He was in his bed. I think another dude was in the room on the other side of the room, sleeping on the floor. And he had these um, glow in the dark, these green glow in the dark stars on his ceiling. And I remember laying down, looking up at the stars, and it was dark. And I'm just focusing on the stars. And I'm falling asleep. And I fell asleep. Then I wake up. And I'm hearing this whispering. It was like, you know, like loud. And it was female. Okay. And it was articulating. It was like someone was having a conversation. And it was creepy because I'm listening at first. I'm like, is someone in the room talking? And then it occurred to me that this is pure gibberish or a language I just didn't recognize at the time. You know, like I know when someone's, I don't speak Russian, but I know when someone's speaking it. I don't speak Japanese, but I, I can tell when someone's speaking it. And, um, you know, because I've watched a lot of movies with those languages and subtitles, and I know those languages. Um, but that was not anything I could recognize. There were no real words being articulated. It was just a cadence, and it was certainly coming from something that was female, and it was loud. And it took a few moments, but then it started to scare me because I'm like, there's something. This is off. This is not right. And there was dead silence in the house outside of the, the whispering. And so I first said, hey, man. Do you hear that? And my buddy in the bed woke up and he was like, nah, man, go back to sleep. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. He was like dead asleep. I get up, I walk into the hallway and the guy lived with his sister and his mother. And I walked over to his sister's room and I looked in and she was dead asleep. I was like praying that she was on the phone or something. I can explain this thing. And I'm just, you know, groggy and half asleep. She was asleep. I walk downstairs. Now I'm creeping around this dude's house and stalking, you know, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking around the kitchen. There's no, you know, coffee maker came on or something. Whatever I can do to explain this thing. It's, it's clearly an, a voice articulating this. And I'm walking. I walk over to his mother's room and did the same thing. I looked into his mother's room and she was asleep. Then I'm kind of like, oh, man, you know, I don't know. What is this? And I walked back to his room and laid down on the floor. And I was terrified because I was like, what am I? I, I, at that moment, I'm like, I'm listening to a ghost. And eventually I fell asleep. I just, you know, sat there and listened to it and I fell asleep. And obviously I'm not hearing it when I wake up in the morning. And I told him, I, Hey man, your house is haunted. He's like, what do you mean? I, I said, have you experienced anything here? He was kind of a wacky dude. He's like, oh yeah, all the time. And I'm like, uh-huh. And so I go back to my parents' house and I think I told my brother about it. And, um, I heard it one more time that night at my folks' house. Okay. It started up again. And this time I'm just listening to it and I'm like, what is this? What is this? And then eventually I fell asleep and I never heard it again. And I never heard it before that. 
And that was as real as real can be. I was wide awake. There was this disembodied voice whispering and I couldn't make out what it was saying. And, you know, some people have some very profound experiences like, you know, they run around places and get scratched and scream and everything. But this was infinitely, even though it was subtle, sort of, it was terrifying, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing something from beyond for sure. And again, to this moment, I don't know what it was. I said it was a ghost back then, but you know, who knows what, what it was. I don't know. I don't know what I was listening to. And um, I did see an apparition once. This was years later. I was living in Michigan. I got an apartment in Michigan with my girlfriend at the time. And uh, we were on the fourth floor and it was winter. And so we were right on Lake Michigan and there was lake effect snow. So it was always snowing and we're right above the concrete, you know, on the fourth floor of this apartment a building. And um, I'm standing at the end of the hallway at the precipice of the living room. In the middle of the hallway is my office. And at the very end of the hallway on the other end directly across from me was the bedroom, which was shrouded in darkness because the hallway lights were off and the bedroom door was closed as far as I knew it. And I'm on the phone and out of the peripheral of my right eye, I see who I thought was my girlfriend, yet she was dressed and moved in a way I didn't recognize out of the, my peripheral. A hundred percent a person, a hundred percent, you know, long, dark hair, pale skin walked into my office. And then I didn't keep my eyes off the office until I got off the phone and I still was looking right at the office. And I walked in, I said, Hey, and there was nobody in there. And again, it's snowing outside, windows shut, fourth floor. There was no one there. And then I um, went over to the bedroom, opened the door, and she was fast asleep, wrapped up in her blankets. So I saw something walk from the bedroom into the office and vanish. That's crazy. Yeah. And we, we, you and I, you and I have talked about like the nature of reality. We've talked about ghosts and what they could be or what they may or may not be. And, you know, you, we do agree that they exist and we've had our encounters with them, but what they are, we're not quite sure. And what you were saying is that you had talked to people who have seen these things and like the Gettysburg, the battlefield, and you were talking about how they had seen these spirits, but they, they were like, they weren't just like, uh, like a picture that was taken in time. Like some people, they say that's a residual haunting. What that is, is basically a ghost you're seeing. It's like a recreation or a replay of something in history. But you were saying that you had talked to people, just like I have, who have seen these things. And it's like, no, dude, these things interacted. You know, and, and I, I bring up the case of the one of the Devil's Backbone where the, the couple, they were coming back from a wedding and, and on a Saturday night. And they look over and they see this, like, confederate soldiers like almost almost walk out in front of their vehicle and they looked flesh and blood well my friend david Wedley, the author he had told me that he had fielded a couple of different reports one was of a comanche a, a warrior on a, on a horse and the person told him it just looked real looked like a real guy another person thought that they were watching a reenactor wearing like a coonskin hat and walking like you know with, with a long rifle through the devil's backbone and they waved at him, and he just kind of looked at him like, who the heck are you? Are these ghosts, or or is this some sort of time slip or, or portal that's opening up? And these areas in, in, it's in, in the Devil's Backbone called the Haunted Valley. It's in between San Antonio and Austin. And it's, you know, we're an area of high strangeness that I think rivals, you know, some of these other places like Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, it's like it has so much going on. And so many people have had encounters there with cryptids, UFOs, and ghosts. But what are they? You know, that that's the big question is like, what are we dealing with? Like, what part of reality is that? Or is it another reality that we just don't comprehend or we don't understand? And is there somewhere, some mountain man writing, wrote in his journal that maybe somebody will find in 20 years, you know, <laughs> like – saw some weird people dressed, you know, in bell bottoms. <laughs> you know what I mean? He describes it, you know, like 
who knows if that's if that's what's what what what's going to happen you know like or if it already happened and the guy tells the story and so you know his great great grandchildren are like you know our great grandfather talked about seeing some weird people that he thought looked like they were from the future or they were some sort of aliens you know um and or maybe it when it came out in an alternate reality you know where that people looked like they were something they were kind of like you know um describing you know us the best they could with what they had to describe you know and and you think about that like there there are cases of of in the bible like ufo's like for example elisha you know he he you know elijah saw this we you know like it's like he went up in a cloud like he went up in a whirlwind you know it's like what what is that like what caused him to go up you know the way that he was taken up into the heavens or, or ezekiel and his will it's like what what's going on with that? Like like what are these? Like is this a UFO that Ezekiel saw? I mean, you know, it, it's it's so uh, just weird. Like when you like and and his description of that is that something that happened outside of space and time? You know, and are we dealing with? Is this what we're dealing with? Like, I mean, is it something that's outside of our space time continuum that we can't fathom? Somehow timelines are intersecting, or is that what a ghost is? Is that what a UFO is? What what are they? It's just so hard to like fathom, you know. That, and it's the nature of our reality that we can't explain, you know. I mean, it's just like you. It's just so hard to wrap your mind around. Like, what was that that you saw? I don't know, and it's but it's good to speculate and uh, consider a lot of different ideas um but the worst is to just say oh you know i'm crazy it's like no i'm certainly not i mean we're all a little crazy but it's just um I'm, i don't have any symptoms uh, i've never hallucinated you know even you know years ago uh you know under the influence of stuff i never saw anything like an apparition ever you know um not like that you know, i was sober standing in a place both times, you know, I was a sober kid at 14 and I was sober when I was in many years sober in Michigan. And, you know, you can't just say it was, you know, I mean, look, you, the greatest ghost story ever written, arguably, is uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's Scrooge is ex- trying to explain it away <laughs> when Jacob Marley is first visiting. You know, oh, it was a, you know, undercooked potato or whatever he says, um, paraphrasing. Or a, or a blob of gravy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he just doesn't want to believe what he's seeing. And, you know, my brother, in a way, is like that because he lives in a house where a gentleman had died. He hit his head in, in the bathroom and crawled his way into a hallway and bled to death and then expired in the hallway. And so, him and his wife, my sister-in-law are now in that house and they've had a lot of odd experiences. They've heard this guy, they've seen him in mirrors. And again, they're not trying to sell the story. I had to push them to cover this in a very unique way in a haunting. We will go partially. There's a lot of other stuff in there and, and hear the perspective of somebody who's kind of like, you know, (laughs) Scrooge's perspective. Cause Jeff, my brother is just like, well, I know these things happen, but I'm not going to tell you it was a ghost. I'm like, well, why not? Because I don't know what it is. You know, he knows he wasn't hallucinating it. And the stuff keeps happening as recent as two weeks ago. Um, Doors shaking in the middle of the night. Apparitions have been seen. He's heard whispering. Um, You know, traditional things that have been written in ghost stories for centuries, right? Um, But then funny stuff. Okay. And this, it's stuff like this that inspires me to write certain things that I have a great idea for. I mean, just a, a an epic ghost story with so many different changes. But I'll tell you the story. It's going to make you laugh. So Jeff's in the mirror and he's shaving, I believe. And he's just getting ready to go to work. And so he felt something, you know, he felt uneasy for a second. And then I'm telling you, he said, I don't know how else to tell you this. But whatever this was came up to my ear and made a fart noise. <laughs> <laughs> Like he was messing with him. The ghost was messing with him, trying to get his attention. 
And why, you know, a trapped spirit may be, hey, these people are in my house. I don't want to leave. Uh, allegedly from neighbors, like the guy loved his home time. He loved his house. I don't know if he sees these people as roommates now. They're exi- coexisting with him. He's watching over them. You don't know. I don't What does a ghost see things? A ghost who's in limbo or some kind of odd purgatory. Uh, and he messes with my brother, not in a nefarious way, but something as funny as making a noise in his ear. So it makes you, you know, as a, as a writer of fiction, you know, and, and, and movies, like you want to, okay, that could be one element, but then I came up with something else. I'm not going to say this because I'll reveal it later when I make the film, but oh man, some of these ideas came to mind and it's not just, you know, it goes goofing off, but imagine if you will, you know, you're a spirit and you're like, let me mess with these people for a little while. It'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I retained my sense of humor, you know? <laughs> it's and How old was the guy when he, when he, when this, when he fell and died? Uh, six, late sixties. Wow. And that would, that would be a horrible, like you just fall and hit your head. And then the next thing you know, you're crawling to your death. I mean, that would be an awful terrifying yeah one of my colleagues lyle blackburn i don't know if you know who he is he has a band called ghoul town he's more well known for that but he's also been on lots of television shows you know they usually just you know they ask him questions and stuff that he's researched because he's a very good author he was an english major so he makes a really good author um you know and a lot of times people go to school for something but they don't necessarily retain it like you you went to school for filmmaking and you're very good at filmmaking. And Lyle's like, he's very good at writing because he went to school for writing. And, but he, he, uh, he writes, you know, these books and I was talking to him. He was on my show two Halloweens ago, not last Halloween, but the Halloween before, like not on Halloween night, it was like a week before. And we were debating Dogman and Bigfoot, whether they're flesh and blood or ethereal. And I had him and Barton Nunley and Ken Gerhardt on the show. It was a pretty good show. It was successful. Um, but, uh, you know, he he made a comment to me and Barton because we were talking. It, it it came up briefly in the conversation about having lived in a haunted house, which I did before fifteen years ago. And now I'm, apparently I'm living in one now, which I'm not thrilled about. I do not like this crap. I've told you about some of the stuff going on. And Lyle had mentioned on the show, he's like, "Oh, that'd be cool living in a haunted house, man. I think that'd be cool, man." And Barton's like, "No, it wouldn't." He's like, "You'll know when it happens to you." Well, shortly after that show, he sold his his house and he bought this house and he, he moves into it. And now he's having what clearly to me is haunting. And, and when he started telling me about it, I had just moved into my new house and I was like, which I don't want to live in now. Uh, you know, it's not, it's new to me anyway. Just like Lyle, he, he had previous people that lived in his house. So did I. My house was built in like 1995. So when you start looking at these, you know, his house was, was, wasn't new, you know, somebody had died there. So he has some stuff going on, you know, he's taking a, a, a drink with a friend of his and, and a glass goes flying and she's freaked out, you know, and it's like these kind of things happening in his house. And, and, you know, he's like, dude, it's unnerving. And Barton, you know, Barton Nunley, the author, he had said the same thing when he was living in a haunted house. He's like, dude, I never felt like I had a moment's peace. I was never alone. That's exactly how it feels. It's terrifying because you don't know when it's going to do whatever it's going to do. And am I going to have these nightmares, you know, and I've started now having nightmares uh, in the house I'm living in where I'm actually in the house walking around doing stuff. That's when you know that it's probably not really a nightmare. You're interacting with things and I had a dream last night that was very, it was a very bad dream. And I can't remember for the life of me what it was. I just remember it was in that house and I was in the house in the dream and I was doing something and I just woke up freaked out. And now we talked about this, you and I, with, with the dreams, you know, you, you said for years you've been plagued by uh, apocalyptic dreams. I, yeah. I have vivid dreams all the time. Um, but I've had some apocalyptic dreams for sure, like visions of, you know, for instance, okay, so it would be, and these are oddly shaped structures, buildings, but then they would change structure if you turn or you walk into a different place. But there's always other people there. A lot of people I just don't know, but, you know, talk to in the dream. And so there was one dream that I had where I was, um, 
it was in this structure. It was a big building, but these big, huge windows you could see out and across you could see a city. And I'm walking with this person and we're looking and I said, I can't believe this is really happening. And I'm looking out and we're all looking and we see the street go across the sky down towards the skyline of the city. And then the city just blows up. And I screamed to this woman, get down. And the shockwave came and hit the windows. The windows shattered and lights went out. You know, exactly what you would expect from something like that. And then I, you know, I've had many of these. And then I would, I had another one where these, these guys were on jetpacks hovering above people with flamethrowers. People were running and they were just lighting people up. That was another one. And then another one, um, I was warning family to get out of a certain part of, you know, I had already moved ahead with people. And I, I was walking next to this dude and I said, listen, they're not coming. I have to go and get them. And I'm running back towards an area that was about to blow up and it does, you know, weird stuff like that. You know, when I was a, ch- when, and when I was a kid, I had an apocalyptic dream and it was based in my hometown of Taylor, Texas. And it was when I was 13 years old and I was living in this house with my mother, which I think that house was haunted. I, I, I know it was. I know there was a spirit there because sometimes I'd see the door in the bathroom move. But that was the extent. I didn't have a lot of weird stuff happen in that house, but I knew something was there. And one of our neighbors had told us that somebody had died in that house, <clears throat> but they were elderly. Um, so it wasn't like some kind of murder or anything like that. But uh, I knew there was something there. And my sister and her boyfriend, and of course, at one time, Anthony's mother, uh, they all stayed there because I had both of my sisters at one time stayed there different times. And we stayed there for about a year and a half, two years. And I remember just like hearing voices and like little weird stuff, nothing too profound, but at times I would feel like afraid to go to sleep because I felt like something was moving around the hallway and, you know, just stuff like that. And if it's like stuff's around, I can feel it. And one of the things that I remember, and, and it was probably the most profound thing that happened in that house was an apocalyptic dream that I had. And it was, I was walking through the streets of Taylor. And I'll never forget this. It was over there by, by the, by the, by Murphy pond. And I was walking and I went into this shopping center and Anthony, you probably know where this shopping center is. It's where the old, uh, Mr. Gettys used to be. Oh yeah, yeah. You know where the shaved ice is across from the baseball field? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I was walking through there and I looked down and the ground began to crack and open up and I look over And this is before I even knew this guy. This is what's really crazy. And I see my friend, uh, his, which, which he's the brother of the guy that I was hanging out with the night I saw the dog man when I was 15, which would have been two years later or about a year and a half later. And he's standing there. I don't know him at the time. I don't recognize him as anybody I know. And then years later, you know, not years later, but a year and a half later, uh, I knew his, I knew his brother and I, I vaguely knew his brother and we became friends, started hanging out, running around together. And I met his brother and I kept thinking, I've seen you, I've met you, I know you from somewhere, but I couldn't place him. And he's several years older than me. Uh, I think he's like five or six years older than me. And I asked him one day, I was like, I was like, uh, you know, I told him, I said, dude, have you ever had any like weird dreams or anything like, like the, about like the, the end of the world and stuff like that? And he says, yeah, I did. I actually did. And I said, dude. He goes, why do you ask? And so I asked him and we were like on our way to go do something. I can't remember what it was. And I was like maybe uh, 17, 18. And I just remember him saying, yeah, I I have actually, but he wasn't a Christian at that time. Now he's like, he goes to church and my friend who saw the dogma with me is actually a preacher. So he goes to the the church where my, my friend preaches. But what's crazy though, is like, I asked, I told him, I said, I saw you in a dream that I remember now where I saw you. And the the ground was like opening up and people were, were dying and there was like stuff flying overhead. And and I was it was crazy. And he was just about to start talking to me about something. And then we ended up getting to where we were at. And then a friend of ours came up to the car. And then I never revisited that conversation with him. But I am now. I'm going to go back after you started telling me about that. And I started thinking about it. And I was like, that is so weird because I actually saw someone in my dream who I believe that I was was destined to meet later on, you know what I mean? 
And I don't know what it was in that dream, but I was like a grown man and I was just walking and the streets were opening up and there was like lava stuff coming up out of the ground. Wow. And the first time I had a, a dream like that, I was like, I think I was like 10 th th that I remember anyway. And I remember just having a dream when we were living in, in my hometown. Again, there it is. It was, you know, and I was 10 years old and I, I had a dream that the sky had opened up and there were these trumpets playing and there was all this like angels coming down from the sky and I woke up, but I was terrified. I was scared because I knew that the end of the world was there and I was about to die, but I was okay with it because I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to be okay. And then maybe I think when I was uh, 16, right, like a year or two after I saw the dog, maybe 17, I had a dream that I was being chased by a lion. And the only way I could get away with it was by jumping real high and hanging onto this uh, lamppost. And it was in the middle of a, of a wide open field and there was nobody around. And I had that one a couple times, but it was weird because it would alternate between being like a lion. And then sometimes it would be like this werewolf looking creature that would chase me up onto the like steps of like a house or a cabin. And I just kind of like, they, they just kind of became intertwined, but Dreams, I think, are very profound, and they have a big uh, impact on our decisions and in our lives, and people don't realize that, and they kind of like just take it for granted that it's just like, like you said, Scrooge, he's saying that it's just a blob of gravy. You know, you're more gravy than ghost. You know, pe people just take it as like, oh, I ate something bad, so I had a weird dream, and they don't really understand it, but the fact that you have had multiple uh, apocalyptic dreams, it, it is, it's, that is weird. And you asked me the question, which I wanted to pose on, on the air. You asked me if I thought we were on the precipice of something, you know, like, are we, are we on the verge of something? And I said, yes, I do believe that we are. I believe that we are coming toward the end of an age, not the end of the world, but the end of an age. And I do believe that that's what's happening. Yeah. I mean, you know, profound change has already happened and I'm sure you can expect a little more chaos up ahead uh, only because it's a pattern and patterns repeat themselves. And, and you know, some people are going to behave badly next year. It's going to happen. And yeah. And not just uh, economically, but I think everything that happens in the spirit trickles down into the flesh. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So Chris, any final thoughts? Do you want to, do you want to say anything else folks? I know this is like the third is going on. It'll be a third episode we've been together on this show, but then, what do you what do you have going on? Do you want to say anything? Let people know how to find you, how to reach you. Yeah, I mean, if you get a chance, I'd love for you to check out uh, "Off to the Witch." I think you'd enjoy it, and so you could search my show anywhere you find your podcast. But keep an eye out because I have uh, several movies in different stages of production. One of which is uh, my new series, my docudrama series, and the first chapter is called "A Haunting We Will Go," and it will be out in October this October, and. Um, a lot of good things happening, and uh, you know, I'm releasing a, a piece of literature, that a screenplay that I wrote that is now being looked at by a few networks uh, and a big production company to make it into a limited series, and got a lot of good stuff going on. I rarely have the interest of collaborating with a big network again, but in this case, the, the leader of the thing is a good guy, so I'll, I trust the situation. Um, and... Uh, yeah, just keep an eye out for everything. I'll be working away on everything and, um, you know, our collaboration and uh, see you soon. Yeah. And so, folks, that's Christopher Garitano, a name, if you don't know, you probably will eventually. And he's he's made a mark already. Like, he, he definitely impressed me with his Strange World and his Montauk Chronicles. Anthony, you have any closing thoughts, closing thing, remarks for Chris, the audience? I'm just looking forward to uh, any and all future projects, Chris. I think that your uh, your presentation is is something special um, because when it comes to presenting information, you can have all the good information in the world, but if you don't have a good way to present it to your viewer or your reader or your listener in a way that allows them to not just retain but digest it, then you have nothing. And you have a creative talent for allowing people to – uh, absorb complex ideas and break them down on a level that allows them to understand them on a mm -hmm. personal on a personal level. So then there's really something to be said with that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Making it palatable 
for the for for us lay people. So anyway, <laughs> Chris, oh, br- you. you're a brilliant guy, and, and I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy uh, our, our postulating on different theories about all these different things we talked about, folks. Come to the conference, September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, any one of those days, whatever. Chris is going to be there, and he's hopefully – I think a haunting we will go, will be already out by then. Is that where – is it? It'll be ready to come out by the conference. I mean, I can bring some scenes or a new uh, the new and improved uh, official trailer and whatever else, and uh, we could talk about it, whatever you want to do. I'm, I'm happy to try something fun for this uh, convention. I, uh, I'm excited to go. Yeah, and we're excited to have you. And, folks, come check us out. Uh, as we said before, it's on, uh, what is it on? The conference tickets are at eventbrite.com. Um, if you're on, like I said, if you're on Spotify, just go to eventbrite.com, type in the search box, Paranormal Roundtable, Dogman, Encrypted Conference. If you're listening to us on YouTube, just go down to the d- description right there below the video. There should be a link. You just click on that. It'll take you right to the Eventbrite page and you can buy your tickets. Yep. It's hosted by me and Ken Gerhard. We did it last year. And we we knocked it out of the park. We're hoping to get if we get half as many people as last year, I'm happy. I mean, it may not happen. The economy's not great. I get it. But if you can go, it's the one conference to make this year because we have an all star lineup. There's going to be a huge bunch of, and, and a lot of collaborations are going to come out of this. I can tell you. So, folks, that's all the time we have for Paranormal Roundtable. Uh, thank you for joining us, and you know, for the third installment of. Uh, Basically interviewing the man behind Off to the Witch, and he will be off to a honey we will go, and he's going to keep going. <laughs> and hopefully a collaborating we will go, me and Chris, because we have some ideas and some because some plans. We want to get some things done. We certainly will. Yeah. And, and so here's to the future. Thank you, Chris, for coming on. Thank you for talking and giving us your thoughts and just all the different ideas we kicked around, all the things that we discussed. It was a great discussion, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Likewise, thank you so much. So for me, Anthony, Chris Garitano, everybody at Paranormal Roundtable, good night.